James chapter 2 and Isaiah chapter 41. We'll read two verses tonight as we begin this a new series entitled Men Who Met God. Men Who Met God. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first thought, when I first thought of that, or saw that, Men Who Met God, I thought, wow. I don't know. It, just, it, just, it registered to me, Men Who Met God. And uh, that, that thought started with me actually probably well, several months ago. And I've been thinking about it, and God just led me this direction. And this is where we're going to go the next several weeks, talk about in our Sunday evening service about men and potentially women in the Bible who had an encounter with God, and it changed them. What happened when they met God? Well, the first character we're going to study tonight, we find in James chapter 2 and in the book of Isaiah, James chapter 2, verse number 23. Notice these words. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And notice, and he was called, what? The friend of God. Turn with me back to Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8. You say, well, no, James said he was called the friend of God. Yes, but notice this. These are the words of God himself. He's speaking through Isaiah. Isaiah 41, verse 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant. Jacob have I chosen, the seed of Abraham. Last two words. My friend. I don't know about you, but to me that's awesome. The fact that someone was called my friend by God himself. Abraham had an encounter with God. He met God, and it changed him forever, and he's remembered as the friend of God. Let's pray tonight. <clears throat> Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for your blessings, thanking you Lord, for your mercy, your love, and your grace. And Lord, tonight as we look at the Word of God, Lord, I pray tonight that you would Lord, communicate the truth tonight that you've given to me. Lord, I pray that you would Use me in a mighty way, Lord, to speak tonight as you would have me to. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would have freedom, Lord, to stir and to touch hearts. Lord, tonight we would be challenged that we would be men and women, Lord, who have an encounter with you, and it changes us dramatically. Lord, we love you. We give you praise and honor and glory. For Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So we talked tonight about Abraham. He's going to be our first, if you a case study about men who met God. The fact that he is called the friend of God, once again, amazes me. Not just simply that James wrote he's the friend of God, but that God himself says, Abraham, my friend. I don't know if you still do this or not. If you're honest with yourself, you probably do. Not to maybe as great a degree as you did maybe when you were in high school or college. Friends were very important. And you would look and say, I want to be part of that crowd. Remember that? And you would do anything and everything and try to get into that group. Because if you got in that group, you were it. You were something, right? I don't know about you, but you know, even, even as a pastor, there's people that I look at, and I, I'm here. I look at them, I think, they're here. Now, I, I know we're all equal in God's sight, but you know, you know what I'm saying, right? In fact, re- re- just recently, I was with somewhere with Robin, <clears throat> and one of these individuals that I look up to, you know, I'm here, he's here. We, we've met a few times, and, but we don't really know each other, know each other. We've had some little conversations, but it recently happened, we ran into him, and he remembered my name. You know where I'm going? You felt that? He remembered my name. He knew who I was. He knew where I served. He knew. He, he remembered me. And I told Robin, I, well, after he left, I, I punched her. He knew my name. I felt like I had just gone up a little notch. Like, I know that's pride. I need, to think, I need to pray and ask God to forgive me. But you know what I'm saying, right? That Here's somebody I look up to. I, I see him as, as above me and better than me, but he knew me. He remembered me. 
Here's me. There's God. And yet, he looked down at Abraham and said, Abraham, my friend. My friend. Tonight, as we think about men who met God, we want to talk about Abraham tonight. And we're going to talk about him maybe a couple, two or three weeks here. Look at different instances and encounters he had with God and the definitive change and decisions that he made. And each week I'm going to try to give you at least one particular thought to take home with you, something to challenge you with. But tonight as we begin looking at Abraham, the friend of God, I'm going to look at four points tonight. We're going to look at, first of all, Abraham's background. What makes Abraham so special? That may be our first thought. What makes Abraham so special that he's called the friend of God? He must have been some really, forgive me, cool dude. Right? What what made him special that he was the friend of God? Well, let's look at his background. Look with me, turn back to the book of Genesis. And we spend most of our time this evening looking at the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 11 and 12. I'm just going to pull some things out to you to, to look at Abraham's background. What was it that made him special that, if you will, God said, I want him to be my friend? That's kind of the way we think, isn't it? Let's look and see what's special about Abraham. Look at chapter 11 of Genesis. Start with me in verse number 28. This is the end of one of those great passages that we all love. Genealogies. Yeah, we always start the year great, right? We're going to read through the Bible this year. We do great through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Well, not so much Leviticus, you know. We get, but we push through Leviticus, then we get the Chronicles. And I'm like, oh, man, really? All these names I can't pronounce. Well, there's good stuff in there. Pay attention. At the, end of the, at the end of this genealogy, verse 28, it says, And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram, there he is, and Nahor took them wives. The names of Abram's wife were Sarai, the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishkah. But Sarah was, Sarai was barren, and she had no children. So uh, what made Abraham special? Didn't you see it? Nothing. Nothing. Didn't say anything great and awesome about Abram, did it, does it? No. Now look with me at verse number 1 of chapter 12. So it's all this great, huge background of how, how Abram's so awesome. No, not really. Notice the first few words of chapter 12. Now the Lord said unto Abram, wait a minute. God spoke to this man there's nothing special about? Absolutely. Absolutely. You see, if you study, study the history here, you're going to understand that when well, we had this genealogy, Abram is coming from a background of pagan worship. Pagan worship is all around him, everywhere. Now remember, think about this book of Genesis. We've, we've had Adam and Eve, we've had Cain and Abel. We've seen two lines of genealogy, if you will, the, the sons of God and the, and the wicked. We've seen two lines, the wicked and the, and the not, you know. We've seen that. Then we come to net to to Noah, and of course the flood. Now there's one line of genealogy, and we come to Abram, and then the narrative picks up again. And Abram is surrounded by pagan worship. Now I don't know if that means anything to you tonight, but let me just put it to you plain. So are we. Abraham has a lot in common with us. He was there. He was in Ur of the Chaldees. He was surrounded by pagan worship. But get this. Abram has no Bible. Heathen. Why didn't he have a Bible? It wasn't written yet. What he had was like verbal. or been passed down. Moses hadn't come on the scene yet. No, Abraham is before Moses. Moses writes the first time. So he doesn't, have, he doesn't have a Bible to turn to. He doesn't, have, he doesn't have a hymn, though. He can get encouragement from some, some good Christian songs. He doesn't have a church to go to. Not a good independent Baptist church. Or any Bible-preaching church. He has no even religious tradition to follow. Remember, Moses hadn't come on the scene yet. There's no Levitical system. 
only thing that's been passed down to him, which came from God to Adam, was sacrifice. Blood had to be shed. For, that's all he had. He had no preacher he could go to. Had no evangelist coming to town. He had no internet to Google, praise the Lord. I can imagine the pagan worship he would have gotten then. He had no seminary. He had none of that. But what did Abraham have? Well, I believe Abraham simply had this. He had a hunger for righteousness. You know, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 says this. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Romans chapter 4, verse 22. Speaking of Abraham. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. See, in Abraham's background, there was nothing special about Abraham. Remember, Jesus even makes this point in the New Testament. Remember how the Pharisees and Sadducees were all prideful? We're the sons of Abraham. What did Jesus say? This is, this is the paraphrase. This is the Knox paraphrase. If I'm one of the sons of Abraham, I can raise them up from these rocks right here. Being a son of Abraham means nothing. Being a son of God is different. They were so proud to be sons of Abraham. And Jesus made the point, Abraham wasn't anything special. He was special because I used him. There was nothing special about him to make me choose him. There was nothing special about him. Listen. If we think about the men who met God, and if we desire to be that kind of individual... Our encounter, our experience with God, our relationship with Him, our fellowship with Him is not dependent on how great we are. It's dependent on how great He is. You understand that? The awesome fellowship we have with Him is because of His greatness, not ours. So as you look at the background of Abraham, isn't it a great background? He's just awesome, isn't he? No. There's a point for that. There's a point. There's nothing special about him. There's nothing special about you. But you guess what? God still wants to have an encounter with you. He still wants to use you. And so we're going to see tonight, he wants to call you and me his friend. So we see Abraham's background. Then number two, look at God's plan. God's plan. Look at chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3. So we've been, we've been introduced to Abram. Nothing particular great about him. Uh, he does seem to be at least a good person because he takes in his nephew because his nephew's parents die. But notice chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of, the, out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And these shall all families of the earth be blessed. Listen, God reveals to him his plan. Now, I don't mean to be disrespectful or sacrilegious or anything, but here we have, if you have phase two of God's plan. It's all been God's plan. Nothing's changed. But up until this point, God has relied on individuals to proclaim the truth. You understand that? How did Cain and Abel know they're supposed to offer sacrifices? How did they know? This isn't a deep question. How did they know? Adam told Adam was supposed to tell them. Okay? When, when, when God decided to, to bring the flood, how did he communicate that? Through Noah. Individuals. He'd been using individuals. Now time has moved on. Population has increased. Now we have the rise of nations. So what's God's plan? I'm going to move from using individuals to using a nation. I'm going to raise up a nation to proclaim the truth. So understand, this is, this is his plan. He's going to move from individuals, even though nations are made of individuals. He's not going to raise up a nation to proclaim the truth. The truth that there is one true and living God. The truth that he created mankind. 
that he loves mankind and he will redeem every man, woman, and child who is willing to accept that redemption. He's going to raise up this nation to proclaim that truth. But in order to raise up that nation, guess what he's looking for? He's looking particularly for a man. Abraham, Abram, I'm going to raise up a nation, and guess what? I'm going to start with you. Could you imagine? Brother Terry, what would you think? God came to you and said, I'm going to raise up a nation, and you're the man. <laughs> Woo! Now, now let's, let's, just, let's be honest. You know, we, sometimes you know, we have a great privilege in having the Word of God and, and knowing the Bible stories. But can you imagine not having a Bible, not knowing the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, and being in Abraham's shoes and hearing, I'm going to, write, I'm going to raise up a nation out of you. Could you imagine being Sarai? Now, I don't know about you. This is the way I would think. My wife can't have children, so well, this is going to be great. God's going to raise up a nation, and I'm going to be king. He's going to get all these people, and I'm going to rule over them. This is going to be awesome. Now, don't, t don't look at me that way. So you would have thought the same thing, wouldn't you? God's going to raise up a nation. He's chosen me to be the leader of that nation. But was that God's plan? Was he going to raise up people? No. In fact, we see his plan in verse number 3. Somewhat detailed, but not very detailed. Then we see Abraham reacts in verse number 4, 5, and 6. And in verse 7, he gives more detail. The fact that we assume, okay, Gives a little bit more detail to it. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. I remember he mentions the family earlier. Now, I don't know about you. I'm just, I'm just trying to think like, like I would think. Sarah can't have children, so you know what? I got Lot here. He's my nephew. He's, he's family. So maybe, maybe through him and through all these other people, God's going to do this. But then as God, as he begins to move and obey God, God reveals a very important detail. No, Abraham, no, Abraham. It's not going to be through Lot. It's not going to be through all these other people. It's going to be through your seed that I'm going to do this. See, God has a special plan to rise up, raise up a nation, but in that special plan, he needed a man. I use that word needed in, a, in quotes, okay? God doesn't need anything. But he wanted a man. He was looking for a man to be willing to follow his plan. Abraham was going to be that man. So we see Abraham's background, nothing special. We see God's plan. He's going to move, moving predominantly individuals to so now raising up a nation among the nations to proclaim the truth. With that, we find number three, the encounter. The encounter. See, there was Abraham, and there was God. And what happens in chapter 12? They come together, they meet. There's an encounter between God and man. Notice once again, verse 1 of chapter 12, And the Lord said unto Abram. Notice if you would turn over to chapter 17. Chapter 17. Verse 1, and when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram. There is an encounter, more than one, an encounter between God and Abraham. Notice in this encounter, who made the first move? Who made the first move? It's not a trick question. God made the move. God said unto Abram. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful God made the first move. Because there's nothing I can do in and of myself to move toward God. It's only by the grace of God that I can go before the throne of grace. God made the first move. Remember, 
Jesus Christ was a lamb slain when? In God's eyes. Before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ himself said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The spirit with the bride, the church, cries out, whosoever will, let him come. God took the initiative. Aren't you glad God took the initiative? He ought to have a plan in place for our redemption. He put that plan in motion right there in the Garden of Eden. Jesus Christ was the accomplishment of that plan. And then he cries out, whosoever will, let him come. What else could you or I do to earn favor with God? Nothing. God made the first move. Not only make the first move, but understand God's love motivated the first step. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved. He so loved the world. See, as we look at Genesis chapter 12 and see God's plan moving from individuals to nation, you understand this is all part of God's plan. It is him moving. And notice in this moving, he, God, steps over the threshold into personal encounters with men. Because he's looking for a personal relationship with us. God's initiative stepped forth to meet a man, to have an encounter with an individual who wanted to know God, who wanted to believe God, who wanted to live for God, and that initiative resulted in an experience that Abraham had with God. What do you mean experience? You getting, are you getting um, charismatic on us there, preacher? No. But I think, you, I think you'll agree with me. When Abraham had an encounter with God, his life changed. I want to talk about some charismatic experience. We're not going to fall out on the floor and start laughing and uh, go hysterical. And, uh, no, that's not what I'm talking about. So when you and I have an encounter with God, things change. They should change. When I use the word experience, I'm talking simply about this. A conscious, intelligent awareness of God, of his presence, and of his revelation. When God spoke, Abraham had an, a conscious and an intelligent awareness of who God was. He had a, a, a conscious, intelligent awareness that God existed and of his revelation because God revealed to him what the plan was, didn't he? <clears throat> Listen, A.W. Tozer, in his testimony, relates the fact that he, he, he did not grow up in a Christian home. But one day, as a, as a I forget how old he was, as a, a, young, a young boy, maybe, maybe preteen, teen, I forget, but he was, he was out in town one day, and he, he came across this individual who's out on the street corner doing something he hadn't really seen or known a lot about before. He was preaching. He was preaching out on the street, and as he sat there and listened, Tozer, as he looks back later, realizes he was using Matthew chapter 8, or sorry, Matthew 11, 28 and 29 as his, as his text. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know that passage? And he sat there and he listened to that man preach about how God was reaching out, calling men to himself. As that young man heard the gospel plan, he said he ran home, ran up into his attic, and there prayed and asked God to save him. And he, he said this, this a quote from A.W. Tozer, he said this, he says, my feet took me home and to the attic. But it was not my feet that went to Jesus. It was my heart. Within my heart, I consented to go to Jesus. I made the determination and I went. 
See, A.W. Tozer had an encounter with God, didn't he? Do you remember when you had an encounter with God? I hope you do. That encounter I'm talking about is your salvation. When God revealed himself to you, maybe it was through mom, maybe dad, maybe a Sunday school teacher, and it was revealed to you, he loves you, you're a sinner, you're doomed to hell, but God loves you, and has a plan to redeem you, so you don't have to go there. Jesus Christ died for you. As that was revealed to you, God was speaking to you. You came under conviction, and hopefully or not, you responded in a positive way, and you had an encounter with God, didn't you? And hopefully you can say you've never been the same ever since. You had an encounter with him. Listen, the Bible that you hold in your lap tonight, hope you hold it in your lap, or maybe sitting in the pew beside you, that Bible you had, you know, it was given to us for a reason. Let me give you a clue. It wasn't to collect dust. It wasn't to sit on the coffee table or to sit on the shelf. Listen, the Bible was given to us for a reason. You understand the Bible is the word of God. What happened in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1? And the Lord, now the Lord did what? He said unto Abram. Abram received words from God. What have you received from God? Words. The very words of God. The Bible was given to us to lead us to meet God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. To lead us to meet him in a clear, very sharp encounter that would burn and rest within us forever. You see, when we meet God on his terms, his terms are by grace through faith, when we meet God on his terms, we experience an awareness in our hearts that we've never experienced before. There's an encounter. Hopefully you've encountered that experience tonight. But notice this. As we see Abraham's background, as we see God's plan, we see the encounter, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Point number four is this, Abraham's response. See, there was an encounter, but Abraham had a choice, didn't he? What was Abraham's response? What would your response be if God came to you and told you what his plan for your life is? Most of us would be scared stiff, wouldn't we? Think back 25 years, if you're that old. A couple of here are not quite yet. Think about 25 years. If God would have told you 25 years ago what the next 25 years would have been like, how many of you would have run? Yeah. Yeah, me? Absolutely. God doesn't typically do that, does he? He just us one step at a time. Abraham had a choice. Abraham, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to use you to do it. Notice Abraham did have a positive response because in the verse number four, Abraham departed. Well, that's a good thing. That's what God told him to do. He, didn't, he wasn't running. He was following God's plan, wasn't he? So Abraham had a definite response. Understand, a definite response is needed. A genuine Christian experience is always going to be tied to an encounter with God. There are a lot of people who have experiences that don't last because they're Tied to circumstances, not God. You've seen it. I've seen it. Somebody hears the C word. Where are they at on Sunday? Church. They hear some diagnosis, maybe in the order. Where do they go running? But then two weeks later, the doctor tells them, oh, it was a mistake. It's a false reading. Where are they at next Sunday? In bed. <laughs> in the beach. See, their experience wasn't with God, was it? It was with circumstances. And when the circumstances changed, 
they changed. God doesn't change. When we have an encounter with him, a true encounter with him, we stay faithful. The change is permanent. See, Abraham's encounter produced a definite response. If you don't get anything else tonight, I want you to get this. Abraham met God, and this was his response. You ready? Write it down. This is his response. Now, you're not going to find it in Scripture. This is, this is application, okay? His response was this. I am willing to pay any price for the privilege of knowing God. I'm willing to pay any price whatsoever for the privilege of knowing God. But God came and he said, Abraham, this is who I am. This is what I want you to do. What did Abraham do? He, he left, didn't he? I'm willing, to, I'm willing to do anything just to know God. Whatever the price is, doesn't matter. What was the price? He had to leave his family. He had to leave his kindred. He had to leave his culture. He had to leave all of that behind. But Abraham said, doesn't matter I'll pay anything just so I can know God. Can we say the same thing? Remember what was Abraham called? The friend of God. Abraham, he says, my friend. What a privilege to be admitted into the circle of God's friends. Can I encourage you with something? John chapter 15, verse 15 and 16. Where Jesus says these words to his disciples by application to us tonight, if you are his disciple. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. I've called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You've not chosen me, I've chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. You understand tonight? If you think about Abraham, his encounter with God, the encounter that led to him being called the friend of God, that same invitation is open to us. I haven't called you servants, I've called you. Friends. Not only did Abram's experience bring a definite response, but it brought about a definite action. What happens in verse number four? He acts on his decision. He departs and he leaves to follow God. Where? Some great big city, right? No, he left the city and went to wilderness it was demonstrated by a departure but it was also demonstrated in, in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 3 by this notice and Abram fell on his face and God talked with him there was a definite response but a definite action his response was yes I'll, I'll go I'm going to pay any price the price we see was the departure and submission. A reverent submission. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 3, where do we find Abraham? On his face. You see, he realized God was on the throne talking, so Abraham got on his face and started listening. See that? Now, here, here, here's the catch. Here's where we are. This is what happens when we talk about the God being on the throne. The hairs on the back of our neck start to stand up because I don't like that. I don't like God being in charge. If any of anybody ought to be in charge of my life, it ought to be me understand something. He had a submissive, a reverent submissive response. Now, you can read the rest of chapter 17 if you want to uh, and read the life of Abraham. 
and you'll find this is the case with many people who meet God, their first response typically is fear. Fear. You know how many times we rebel against the thought of God being on the throne? Fear. But if you read the lives of these men and women who met God, many times it starts with fear, but that fear then realizes the delightful awe of an awesome relationship. And then culminates in a complete nearness of God. Think about Enoch. We don't know much about Enoch, but we know this. Enoch walked with God. He had a complete nearness. He was right there walking with God. And think about the life of Abraham. When Abraham receives the covenant, the covenant's been spoken of, when that night comes, remember that he has that vision. We've kind of explained this before. We'll talk about it later, later again. And he sees the burning lamp in the furnace. I'm sure Abraham wasn't going, yay. I don't know about you. I'd be, uh, okay. This is a little scary. He was afraid. What about Moses at the burning bush? It started with curious, but then all of a sudden it went from curious to, oh boy, real fast, didn't it? But as they progressed with that encounter, notice it goes from fear to awe to walking to nearness. See, the reason so many Christians today are shallow and empty is because they're more interested in the throne than the king who sits on it. They're more, important, they're more concerned about who's on the throne, namely not them, rather than having a personal relationship who actually belongs on the throne. They, they become dissatisfied, dissatisfied. They exhibit little of any interest in the things of God. So you know what happens? They respond like someone else. What do you mean? Okay, stop and think about it. Okay, here we go. We got Abram. He has an encounter with God. What's his response? God's on the throne talking, so he... Falls on his face and listens. There's somebody else in Scripture. We have time to go there tonight. Hopefully, you know the story. You know, there's somebody else who, while God is talking, he's on his high horse plotting to take the throne. Remember, anyone remember who that, who that is? Satan, Lucifer, right? God's on the throne. He's talking and plotting, and and Lucifer's on his high high horse saying. I will, I will, I will, I will. Right? What happens? See, there was a definite response in Abraham, but in Satan we see a defiant response. Same basic scenario. God's on the throne, God's talking, but two different responses. Satan's is defiant. The Christian who refuses to listen often takes the same approach that Satan does. What is that? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse, 18, verse 8, we are warned of Satan. We find these words. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about doing what? Seeking whom he may devour. Check it out. Think back in history. Think about individuals who rebelled against God I want to be on the throne of my life, not God, and see if it isn't true. The majority of the time, those individuals begin to devour other Christians. Why? Because just like Satan, every time he looks around, he looks at Community Baptist Church, baby, he, he sees Miss Rita, he sees Miss Sandy, and he sees George, and he sees people. He looks at you and goes, oh, man, I can't, that Ed Sides guy, I can't stand him because he reminds me every day that God's still on the throne. Here's a man that's yielded to God because God's on the throne, and I hate that, and I hate him. I'm going to devour him. How many Christians do the same thing? They're rebellion against God, and when they see a Christian living for God, what starts to happen? Then there's the backbiting, the stabbing, the gossip, devouring other Christians who remind them God is still on the throne, 
And they were rebelling against it. They can't get to God, so they do like Satan. Get to whoever they can that reminds them God's on the throne. They begin to act like Lucifer himself. If we're not careful, we'll be like that and we'll find ourselves not only devouring other Christians, but reducing our concept of who God is. Like we talked about this morning, not believing God's good. Reducing that concept, reducing our estimate of who God is and actually begin to live in such a way that we actually think we can manage God. What do you mean? I'll give you an example. I'm going to use Brother Terry. I used to pick up Miss Jane. She's on this side. I'm going to switch over here and I'll pick up Brother Terry. So, Brother Terry, over here, he, he's facing a decision in life. And since he does our Dave Ramsey stuff, it's going to be a financial decision. Okay? He's facing a financial decision. And, <laughs> and he's been praying about it. And God says, don't do it. He doesn't have peace about it at all. But Brother Terry, being human like I am, does this. But I really think it'll work. I really think, you know, I can really see this thing panning out for it. I mean, I've, been, I've done some research, and I just, I don't know why God's not giving me any peace, but you know, I really see this working out for me. So he does it anyway. Brother Terry, I, I know you've never done this, but I'm going to confess I have. I've done, it. I, I've done something, and the whole time I'm thinking, but if I do it, I'll just pray God will bless it. Because if I do it, what can he do about it? I wouldn't say that out loud. You wouldn't either. But how many of us have acted that way? I don't have peace about it. I'm going to do it anyway. And then when I get in the middle of it, God's going to bless it. He's, I mean, he loves me. I'm his child. I mean, and what are we trying to do? We're actually trying to manipulate God, aren't we? God's on the throne talking, and what are we doing? We're like Satan, Satan on our high horse, plotting how we can maneuver God and manipulate him to bless what we want him to bless. How does it work that way? Because we reduce our estimate of who God is. I think that somehow we can manage Him. Now, all that being said tonight, we see a definite response, a defiant response. But lastly tonight, under this Abraham's response, there is a do response. What do you mean, preacher? I mean, tonight, right here, right now, we owe God a response. I'm not talking about Abraham anymore. I'm talking about everyone sitting a community Baptist church, everyone watching online, you owe God a response tonight. The response is due. There are no late responses. The paper is due now. What's your response going to be? Do you realize most things in life operate best when they are fulfilling their purpose and their design? No, I have never bought a piano. But we have a beautiful one over here, don't we? I, I have been in some stores where I've looked at pianos. I have never been into a store that sold pianos that had a sign sitting on top of the piano and says, 19 different uses for pianos. This piano is great for holding your family pictures. This piano is just at the right height to change the light bulbs in your ceiling. This piano comes with a Piano bench that makes a great footstool. Now, can you use pianos for all those reasons? Yeah. But is that the purpose of a piano? No. When is this piano being used and being fulfilled as it's supposed to be fulfilled? When somebody's playing it. Not when somebody's standing on it, changing the light bulb, and don't you dare do that to the piano. Okay? Don't get any ideas, kids. Okay? Now, it's true, you could use a piano for a lot of different things. And, you know, some of you may have a piano in your house that its main function is to hold family pictures. 
But that's not the piano being fulfilled, is it? You see, when it is used as it was designed to be used, that, that is when it operates best. God has designed you for a purpose, designed you for a reason. And you are best fulfilled, you operate best when you fulfill that purpose. And I'm going to say it, and it's going to rile some feathers, but I'm going to say it anyway. What is it? It's to worship and to glorify God. <laughs> Listen, we get in this, in this mindset of how dare God. Listen, God is not a dictator to beat you over the head. He is a king on a throne that has the power to do all things, and he calls out to you, will you be my friend so I can fulfill your life? He's not beating you over the head. He wants to give you. Remember our verse this morning? Uh, Psalm 84, verse 11. Last part of that verse. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. We've got to give us the mindset of God being some dictator, some vengeful God who's going to make our life miserable. No. He calls out to you and to me, I've not called you servants. I've called you friends. Friends. You know, the great thing about, well, there's a lot of great things, but one of the great things about Abraham here is the fact that God was always there. It's just in Genesis 12, he has an encounter with Abraham. Abraham becomes aware there's a God who really loves him, he wants to do something awesome with his life. And what does he say? Yeah. He'd look at the price tag, he didn't care. God, you want to know me? Man, whatever it costs, I'm willing to do it. Okay, leave everything. Done. Just so I can know you. What's your response tonight? He calls to you. Will you be my friend? I want to invest in your life. I don't want to hold anything good. For, I want to give it to you. Will you be my friend? Trust not you have a, an experience with God. Experience that will change you. And realize, as we talked about this morning, how God is good. Father, we come here tonight. And we thank you for the account here <coughs> in Genesis of, of Abram. Lord, how that, well, there in the book of Isaiah, you said, Abraham, my friend. Lord, as he, as you came to him and revealed yourself to him, or he surrendered all. He was willing to pay any and all the cost just to know you. Lord, I pray that Lord, we will be more like Abraham and not like Satan. Or maybe we Remember the benevolency of the God that we serve and humbly, reverently submit to you. And Lord, allow ourselves to experience the friendship of Almighty God. For we love you tonight. Give you honor and praise for the only one worthy of it all. In Jesus' name we ask it.